Hello friends, I'm no therapist, but I'm your host, Stephanie Goodman. I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a woman of faith. Often friends ask me how I have a successful marriage while blending families and staying optimistic in life. This podcast features people with real life stories about success in relationships and triumph over trial. Growing up in a small mining community around the era of World War II and Vietnam came with its challenges, especially when it comes to the expectations of fatherhood. I'm excited to share with you my own father, Lynn Lee Master, as we discuss the changing roles of fatherhood and healing generations. Hello and welcome to a new edition of I'm No Therapist. But today we're going to focus on those special men in our lives, our fathers. I have in the studio with me Lynn Lee Master, who happens to be my father. Hi, Dad. Hello, Steph. Thank you for choosing to be here today. I'm excited for the conversations that we're going to have. Um, To start us off, first of all, you grew up in a small town that I'm familiar with. Correct. Uh, how many years did you live there? Basically 21. 21 years? Uh-huh. And then you then moved... Then we, when I got married, we moved to the Salt Lake area, Sandy. Mm-hmm. Then we moved back down and spent, what, nine years? Yeah. In Huntington. Was it, I think it was 13, 13 years. 13. Oh, okay. Yeah. 13 years. Yeah. Um, and then we moved to upper Utah in Ogden, and we've been there 31 or 32? 31. Okay. 31 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's good you have the wife here too. <coughs> it's a good thing to she's commemorate here. those Correct details. The facts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Dad, um, I'm I'm excited to be able to get to know kind of the influences that you have had in your life as a father. And so, my first question for you is, what do you remember about your dad? What qualities did he have? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you. I've had a lot of angst about how I was going to answer the questions that you sent me. Okay. And I've just decided to be as frank about it as I can, rather than presenting an ideal scenario. Okay. Kind of give you a better idea of my perspective of that experience. Okay. Okay. My father was a very good man. He had a good heart, and he was involved in church and community uh, deeply. Yeah. His family experience, his dad was disabled and in that time there was no social security or other social programs to take care of you so it fell on the family his older brothers and sisters were basically responsible for helping his parents to get through life okay um his go ahead I was going to say, at what age was that? Was that since he was born that the father was disabled? That I don't know for sure, but I do know that for most of his youth, his father was disabled. He was in an accident working in the coal mine. Oh. And he broke his hip. And in that time, they didn't have x-rays. And really didn't know much about restoring 
bones to where they needed to be. Right. So they um, just did what they did, and my grandfather's, one of his legs was two inches shorter than the other because of the way that hip grew back, and it stuck out, and it was a major discomfort Uh for him. Okay. And... You know, they didn't have the drugs to relieve the pain, so I'm sure my grandfather was in constant pain. Yeah. And <laughs> because he couldn't take care of his family financially, I'm sure there was a lot of embarrassment. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Shame. Yeah, shame. That... Um, he couldn't the be the person that he wanted to be. Sure. And prior to his injury, he was very physically involved. I mean, he was a sheriff of the Carbon Emory area. Okay. And rode his horse. And, I mean, he was very active that way. And this but, was the era of Butch Cassidy, right? Correct. Wow. Yeah he and his father but anyway so that kind of gives you an idea of my dad's orientation to family okay um he was the second to the youngest in his family of i think it was 11 and then three died am i correct And the the older brothers, I mean, they were married when he was still at home. So the the connection there was really remote. Yeah, and there were how many in the family? Eleven. Eleven, and three had passed away. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Which was typical for families at that time. Huh? It's true. You just kind of, um, what, expected or allowed for children dying. Mm-hmm. But, um, so my father's exposure to being a father was very limited. Yeah. And his uh, experience with people around him was also isolated. So his, I mean, he grew up during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And so he had that kind of orientation to life as well. True. True. Um, his brothers were all coal miners, and they were big physical men, except for my oldest uncle, who was a, a small man. But if you talk to someone who knew him, they'd never known anyone as strong as my uncle Fawn. Hmm. He could put his, they had a, a rail on the bridge and he could grab hold of that rail and then just stick his body straight out like a f- human flag yeah oh my goodness but the the community knew you don't mess with the lee master boys okay <laughs> so that was his family of orientation mm. but he was a very sensitive and um, compassionate Mm -hmm. yes, by his nature. And so he didn't really fit in with his family either. Interesting. But he was also, he was involved in a lot of their ruckusness. (laughs) And... um, the influence of the LDS church in his life was limited. Hmm. 
his mother was um, quite committed to it. His father was knowledgeable. Okay. And he enjoyed confronting people <laughs> who were less informed <laughs> than him. And, Interesting. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's, he had kind of a, what, maybe a sarcastic approach to religion. Hmm. Plus, he had that challenge. I, I'm sure that he probably had very little sleep. Um, yeah. I'm sure he was just in, in that constant of pain. pain. Yeah. Yeah. But the story goes that he had his cane and he'd keep his cane by the door. And then he would just use that cane to grab dad or whoever was coming <laughs> through the door. <laughs> so dad. He got his, his needs met then. <laughs> <laughs> in the manner that he was. Accustomed to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so getting back to Dad, um, I felt like that was important because that was his orientation. Um, he lost a brother to the coal mine, and his other brothers were involved in it. Okay. So he went into the coal mine. He, That was just what he was going to be and do. It's what you were kind of raised to expect. Yeah. Was your life career. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when he got married, he was working in the coal mine. Okay. And you've heard the story or the song about 16 ton. You load 16 ton, what do, what you, do get? you get? Another day older and deeper, deeper in debt. Deeper in debt, uh-huh. I owe my debt, I owe my soul, soul to, to the, the company store. store. And that was literally the the environment that the miners lived under. They had um, housing, but you paid rent to the coal company. Oh. And you had stores and you had credits mm -hmm. that you would use your credits Put it during on my tab, the month, right? Exactly. Wow. And the 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 coal company owned the store, so everything in your life resol revolved around the the coal company. I owe my soul to the company store. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So his, <clears throat> I mean. His experience as a husband was one of barely making it mm -hmm. month to month. Okay. And then huh. as he went through life and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and had uh, my sister and brother, um, they decided, he and his brothers decided, well, we're making all this money for the coal company. Let's go make, let's go get a mine of our own and we'll get rich. So they bought a mine in Mill Fork, which is uh, just up the canyon from Huntington. Okay. And they started to mine. Well, that mine I don't know how what my dad's perspective of it was but he he just kept in on it tenaciously hmm. uh, I can remember being eight or nine years old and and going up there to um, fill dummies so he had dummies to blast in the mine and, and what do you mean by dummies? I'm seeing well, they were like paper, a scarecrow. They were a paper sack, basically. Okay. And they were about 
an inch and a half, maybe two inches around. And I would put sand in those dummies. Okay. And then he used those dummies. He would, he would go in and drill the face of the coal and then put these dummies in with blasting caps. And the dummies were there to kind of direct the force into the face of the mine instead of it just blowing out. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> but huh. for like most of... Like a shrapnel of, shield of some sort. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. For most of my youth, um, my dad was doing all that by himself. His... <laughs> occasionally he would have uh, people in the community that he hired to help him mm -hmm. and generally that was compassionate service yeah because those people were in need and so he would hire them and he would pay them but he didn't necessarily have the money to support himself and his family okay and he had how many in his family my family yeah there were four of us my have my sister and brother and then there was eight or nine years between my brother and myself and then there's four years between me and my younger sister okay so they they basically had two families yeah yeah <clears throat> um my so, brother does remember but your, being your dad was involved with the mine with his brothers was he involved with that before he was married no after he was married amazing yeah so the the orientation that i got from my father regarding money mm -hmm. was that you'll never have enough yeah and it will always be a struggle you have to work hard for it you have to work hard for it and all the hard work is still just get you huh. to zero anyway but Constantly as a person um like I said he was really involved in in church activity right. in his later years. In his early years, he wasn't all that involved. He, he was smoking and drinking and being one of the Lee Master boys. Wow. So when he actually had the, the motivation to change his life in relationship to the LDS church mm -hmm. his family supported him as a family but they didn't share his uh, perspective on the importance of it so in other words he was still family to the Lee Master boys but he had a different habit Mm -hmm. I guess you could say yeah. that they didn't totally support. And yeah. so that distanced and them. Part of the family gathering uh, was alcohol. Okay. Um, some of them were involved with smoking as the family grew, but alcohol was a, a big part of the family gathering. And, like I say, initially, he was involved with that. Okay. So, uh, for him to make that shift was a challenge for him. It had to be something that was important enough to him <laughs> that he was willing to do that. But he never got significant resistance from his family. But they just said, don't push it on us. Yeah, okay. And, and he, 
pretty much respected that. Yeah. So he was, as he moved forward from that change in his life, mm -hmm. he was very involved in church activity. He was involved in the community. He was a volunteer fireman. He was a council member. He was um, always, he and my mother were always aware of and looking for opportunities to help someone in the community. Yeah. And he I had the that. support of my mother. Mm hmm. So uh, he did, he and my mother did a lot in the community that no one knew about except the ones who received the service. Oh, okay. Wow. Anyway, <clears throat> so when he passed away, it was a major event for the community. Yeah. Yes, it was. So as a, as a person, he was, uh, he was amazing. But the other side of that was with his involvement with the community and church, he wasn't that involved in my life. Mm. So one of the questions that one of the next questions you had is, you know, did he prepare me to be a father myself? Right. And uh, he prepared me to be a good person. Okay. And I consider myself a good person. Yes. Not, I don't make choices that everyone would say are acceptable okay but I consider myself a good person uh-huh and I also consider the influence that he had as significant in forming that person And I'm aware, one of the things that I kind of wish had been different yeah. was for him to be more open about the challenges he had with money. Generally, when I found out about that it, it was something that I found out that I wasn't supposed to know okay and so I didn't get orientation mm -hmm. of what are the difficulties and maybe how do you meet those challenges it was like maybe shame was part of it maybe it but it, it all go back a, a major influence there was the influence of his father in his life which was very little which was very little and when it was he was consumed with pain and i know how i react when i'm in pain i'm not very talkable you really can't Mm -hmm. get deep with me because I'm so consumed with the pain that I'm experiencing. Yeah. So I can imagine and that. The struggle they had with money, I'm sure, I, when I think about my grandfather, I, I just, my heart goes out to him because of what I perceive as his experience may have been. Yeah. Because in order for you to have a house in the mining community, you had to have a certain amount of clout. Oh. And you waited. You were on a waiting list because the, the coal company didn't 
go out of their way to service their employees. Man, that's some tough times. Yeah. That's so interesting. I'm, I'll put new meaning to that song. I owe my soul to the company store. Yeah. They were singing about their woes. <laughs> Not just a folk tale. Yeah. And then it were, you were saying, I got one arm of muscle and the other one still. Yeah. They had, literally, they had to go in there with their picks and break the coal up and load the... Yeah, they didn't have machines to do it. No. And they... <laughs> then the, some of the... Some of the mines provided um, transportation out for the coal, and some of them you loaded it, and then you were responsible to take it out. Wow! And then you got paid as you contributed. You know, you've got your your dad's situation where he's he's making himself very involved with the community. Mm -hmm. He's giving service. He's involved with religion, what have you. Mm -hmm. And and you were, as you say, of a second family, right? Mm -hmm. Can you share with me, maybe going back, what is the time that you felt seen by your dad? Um, when, when I would do something church-related. Okay. Okay. So um, not only did... Did I feel like there was expectation on his part, but the community expected that also because of the influence that he had in the community. Okay. So to a large extent, um, I put a lot of emphasis on doing what I thought was expected of me. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. Um, and what you felt was expected of you was more driven for the relationship of religion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And did you get that feedback that you were seeking for? Well, <laughs> I got, what, recognition? Uh-huh. In it, so I guess I got what I expected from it. Mm -hmm. But did your dad recognize your talents for? Not really. No, he didn't. He was busy with other things and other people. Okay. So, given that knowledge, did you? make a conscious choice to be more involved with your own family because you didn't want to repeat that pattern, so to speak? To a degree, I did. Yeah. But I wasn't all that involved. Your mother was involved with everything that you guys were doing. Yeah. But I kind of had a pattern of being away from home and just making sure there's food and a house and mm -hmm. car and whatever. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I believe I did provide is that when I had time with you, I was totally focused on you and the time that we did have yeah. was to in my mind of high quality yeah. not necessarily quantity mm -hmm. yeah I think that I can definitely look back on my own life and I can see those times and why they are so ingrained in my mind probably because of your constant dedication to to being focused and being present for me and my siblings at that time mm -hmm. oh. yeah like I say I uh, 
quantity wise it wasn't that that great and one of the things that i was embarrassed about was i never felt like i was creating the kind of financial base that i should be okay and i think that part of that was that energetic inheritance mm -hmm. that came from my grandfather through my dad to me i would, i never felt like i was enough okay yeah that's interesting i've never i've never heard those stories before but i will say that you're not alone in feeling that way mm -hmm. and i believe that we all suffer those demons of we're not enough especially when we go into a place of being a parent of being in charge of these little people that are looking up to us yeah that responsibility of showing up to them and showing them what you need to be as a parent and when you're suffering with your own demons of I'm not enough and comparison excuse me and comparing yourself to those around you mm -hmm. without knowing their stories or, or <coughs> where they got how they got to the place that they are, right? Mm. Well, part of that too is that because of the financial condition that my family was in, most of my clothing came from hand downs from uh -huh. other members in the community. Okay. And one of the things that I think I inherited from my dad was the sensitivity. And being sensitive in your youth, in school environment, is not conducive to <laughs> happiness and enjoyment. Okay. So there were many times when I would be reminded that, oh, that was my shirt that I got I got rid of it. I either I outgrew it or I didn't like and it anymore. You're wearing it. And I'm wearing oh, it. Oh <coughs> wow. Mm -hmm. See now we received hand me downs, but we received it from our cousins who were in another city who we never saw. But I can imagine how hard that would be. Yeah, not to... I understand it now. Right. Looking out in. Mm -hmm. But looking in out was a different challenge. But I, because of that, I always felt like... Um, others were judging what I did or didn't do because of that. But I do want to say that those hand-me-downs, my mother was an amazing seamstress. And some of the clothes that I had were made by her. And... <clears throat> In her time, it wasn't, well, not only was it not unusual, but it was almost standard for people to hand down clothes either in the family or outside the family yeah. just because everybody was trying to help themselves and others survive. Okay. So it wasn't as my experience was things were changing so you had 
guys that were coming home from World War II and from the Korean War, and they had this attitude about life. Okay. And they started changing the way that people perceived life and community. Okay. And so it was kind of the disruption that you get as you're shifting a paradigm in terms of society and community and individuality that just made it a challenge for virtually everyone. Interesting. So these men coming back into the community after being out in war, mm -hmm. what did you notice changed? Well, some of them came back with injuries. Yes. And a lot of them, came when they came back, they didn't want to talk about their war experience. Okay. Um, I mean, now... We take these veterans and say, oh, they have PTSD and, you know, we need to address it. Yeah. Those guys had the same thing, but they didn't have a, a name for it. Right. And they didn't really have treatments for it or people who um, made a profession them. out of helping them. So they yeah. just, they came back and they did what they did. Right. They bought up, right? Uh-huh. But a lot yeah, of them yeah. were, uh, what would it, hard. Calloused. Calloused because of the experience. Yeah. And then those people were the teachers <laughs> and the, um, you know, the members in the community, the farmers and and the people that you encountered in the community so i'm understanding kind of the oh gosh i don't know what other word to use but the depression that was surrounding your generation of of young influential minds at that time how do you feel that you how did you turn on your heart? Because the memories that I have of you are not of dark demeanor in any way. There were there were hard times. I remember that you worked nights and that we were <laughs> kept as silent as possible. Oh, yeah. But we <laughs> were kids, so I'm sure that we were not professional at being quiet <laughs> bless my mother's heart for <laughs> having to rain all those cats <laughs> in the house right meaning the kids <laughs> yeah and and trying to support you doing those graveyard shifts working hard so that you could support our family i need to say first of all that i deeply appreciate the relationship that you and i share as father and daughter and in many ways I know that there's we've been able to heal each other on this journey of discovering our worth um, and like I said you're you're not alone when you recognize those as I call them head trash moments of not recognizing your value and I feel like my purpose in gathering stories like this is to kind of be a gathering where people realize and recognize that they're not alone and that they have they have the opportunity to to make a change to yeah. to turn the page in that chapter of their book right well as i was contemplating some of the thoughts that i wanted to share in relation to your questions. Yeah. I think that one of the challenges and 
maybe some benefit to it, but of life is to learn to be tolerant of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as we gain the skill of being tolerant with ourselves, it helps us to be tolerant with others. <laughs> I laugh because that makes a lot of sense to me, but it it's not it's not a humorous concept. It it is it is truthful. I feel like we're all in this journey of trying to be, well, in my opinion, better ourselves, and in hopes of turning around and maybe healing other generations. Yeah, and that has a lot to do with the the idea of a parent yeah is hopefully providing encouragement and to whatever extent resources yeah that will help the next generation but it's kind of interesting that the the challenge that we're having in our lives now, there's a saying that hard men make for good times. Good times make easy men. Easy men make bad times. And now you're back to the cycle of bad times make making hard good, men. hard men. Huh. I have never heard that quote before. <clears throat> That's fascinating. Yeah. And so where do you see that our generation of new fathers are from your generation? I mean, they grew up in a totally different world. Yes. Than I grew up in. Right. They they have exposure to violence uh -huh. that I didn't have. Correct. They have challenges uh, with emotions that I didn't have. Mm. Or were allowed to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To Interesting. Yeah, but... Um, We have a generation of soft people. Okay. And they... Sensitive. In many ways, they don't Not sensitive. know what it took to get to where we are now. They don't appreciate um, their uncles that were part of World War Two or the Korean War or the Vietnam War. Yeah, right. They they just don't appreciate what it took to get where we are. And they're also being told or taught that things should just come to you because you're here. Right. You're owed you're owed, yeah. 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 And it's creating challenges. <laughs> and I I can't imagine myself going to a school environment that my grandchildren experience. It it would it would just crush me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are they are in a tough place. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like it's these soft times when some of these children will find their true character because of the trials that they experience, right? Hopefully. Yeah. That's uh, when you're dealing with emotions, it's nice to be able to work your way through them but sometimes you get caught in it and you get lost in it yes 
and if you don't have the resources to help you out of it yeah you end up in places that are difficult for you and others mm-hmm. well on that note um i do have a father's day special for you we had some family members that were willing to share some of their their memories with you Ooh, yeah <laughs> okay so i'm, gonna pull I'm looking forward to it i'm the oldest of four in our family and uh my younger sister stacy is about two years younger than me and she she wanted me to emphasize that she appreciates the hours upon hours of sitting with her and listening to her questions and your ability to to be patient and explaining things the way that she could understand um jessica who is two years younger than my younger sister stacy she says i love to listen and watch and play the guitar and i know that all of us in the family can enjoy those memories (laughs) especially at christmas eve Um, I love watching him play the piano and singing. I love when he would play around with the grandkids. He would play the drums, in air quotes, (laughs) as they dance around like (laughs) Indians. I love to watch movies with him because he isn't scared of crying. He has the best laugh and it it makes it wonderful to be around. I love to snuggle snuggle up next to him while he tells me that he loves me. Leonard, who's the baby of our family, (laughs) he says, he is one of my best friends, as well as my father. It took a long time, but we got it. The history between dad and I is not always easy, but now I trust dad with everything and anything. And I try to do whatever I can. To help that was really special to be able to hear those words from from Leonard and mm-hmm. I know that uh, he's very blessed to to have your fatherly influence in the trials and trials that he endures um, Kells says that he always enjoys <laughs> binge watching Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch and Blind Frog Ranch. Um, also coming to our events and movie showings is is an honor to have you here. So cool. that's from your son-in-law. You. Christina, my daughter, my oldest, says one of my favorite memories with Grandpa was the keyboard. All the songs he'd make up, jamming along to the hits such as The Hair in Grandpa's Ears, <laughs> Cowboy, and others. Uh, the music that he made for your friends, probably speaking to me, uh, my love of music and appreciation for expression was directly influenced by him. And who could forget that Grandpa was very familiar with the alien Nomenclature. No, nomenclature. 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 Oh my goodness! I can't even read my own daughter's writing. She's so much more intelligent than me. Uh, or was he? Uh, were we all the aliens all along? She says. Some qualities I admire in Grandpa are finding the magic in the mundane, and purely ordinary. And I can vouch for that our sense of humor and and appreciation for humor has definitely been enveloped because of you. Emily says, my earliest memories of Grandpa was sitting on his lap and looking at him and saying, Grandpa, what's your biggest fears? (laughs) Grandpa looked down at me and calmly replied, children. (laughs) She says, I remember laughing confusingly. (laughs) And then she says, one time when I got sick, um, he was the only one at home because my children were raised by you for a couple of years when I was, well, just a year and a half while I was uh, planting my feet as being a single mom. Mm -hmm. Um, You were home with her and she was sick. And 
she got really hungry and so you picked yourself up and set her down on the couch turning on the TV and then she says you danced your way into the kitchen a few moments later he came back set out a TV dinner table and handed me a cup of cold Sprite and crackers and to top it off the main course was cottage cheese <laughs> I am quite the chef, aren't I? <laughs> indeed. <laughs> indeed. Uh, also, some qualities that I admire in Grandpa are being able to play the guitar and sing. Uh, Michael says, and Michael is my youngest, he says, I also remember enjoying the hair on Grandpa's ears. This is a song that <laughs> my dad wrote. <laughs> Out of the creativity of his mind. Um, and we have been enjoying the tunes. Maybe I'll post that up for you to, to see the, the lyrics of it. I've lost my place real quick. Um, some qualities I admire in Grandpa is that I want my... I want... That I want in my life is that he makes us laugh. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I, of course, have a novel of things, but for the most part, I just I just want to share with you that we have many heartfelt moments with you. The qualities that we've picked up from you are to not take life too seriously, but also appreciate the deepest times and make them valuable. Appreciate the arts that are around us. I remember going to the symphony and having... You teach us to close our eyes and really listen to the instruments and then imagine what stories those instruments are telling us. Um, I believe that these are moments that have helped me to really be enriched by the life experience that I have around me, the people that I have around me. I've learned to listen with not only my ears but my heart because of the example that I have from you. And in many ways, I looked for those kind of qualities in my spouse. And uh, I see the relationship that you and mom share together and how rich that is. The, the best friends that you are and the many adventures that you choose to share together. Your ability to support each other in whatever that adventure is, is so valuable and I I believe that that's one of the key points as to why your relationship lasts as long as it has she is able to have a sense of humor that allows us to be human right that is so profound because Sometimes we forget that we're human or we expect perfection and don't allow ourselves to, to be in compassion. I've always had difficulty with what it means to be a dad. Okay. Um, the idea of the separation of of roles as as we move through life and basically in youth you're there to as a father I felt like I I was there to support the life and growth of my children but as those children grew into adults, one of the most difficult things was to stand back and allow them to experience the consequences. And consequences not necessarily negative, there are also positive consequences. Okay but to experience the consequences of their choices and decisions. Yeah. And to just be there as a friend and a resource, but knowing that you 
have to go through those experiences yourself and the interpretations you make of those experiences yeah will be yours uh-huh and i i think that's <laughs> that's one of the most difficult challenges for my generation i think in my grandfather's generation it wasn't that much of a challenge you were just expected at 17 18 years of age you're on your own you're an adult and and you're on your own but now where we have children that live in our homes yeah and they're adults uh-huh we do it's a different circumstance yeah than what we had in earlier generations definitely and so honestly and being a mother of adult children i can appreciate how difficult that is sometimes <laughs> to allow your children to have their experiences and to just kind of as you say pick them up and brush them off and send them on their way right <laughs> and yeah. try to be in a space of, of loving them whatever that trial is but yeah we want to do the best that we can and and i want you to know that you are doing a, a fantastic job in my book <laughs> and i appreciate the fatherly influence that you have in my life and in my children's lives the truth is conversations that we have the words that are shared all those things are forgotten but the way that you make us feel those are never forgot thank you <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode remember to subscribe share like us on facebook and follow us on instagram Please comment because I would love to hear about what you think and what you want to see in the future. I'm no therapist, but I am your host, Stephanie Goodman.